Thank you very much, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I spent a certain amount of the Christmas holiday watching the Occupied series um, about Norway. And so I'd like to begin by saying I'm pleased to see that you're all still at liberty. Um, and it's great to be here. Um, and let me begin by saying that I, don't, I know that you spent much of the rest of the day on subjects that would seem to matter to you the most as investors and businessmen. Um, the state of the world economy, the possible impact of Brexit, coming technological changes. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about now um, for your last meeting of the day is something a little bit different, namely the ideas that will shape this year. Um, I think all of us feel a little unsettled by the state of world politics at the moment, um, and I think that distress is justified. Um, more than that, I believe that we're genuinely living at a moment of historical change, at a time when the paradigms that govern all of our assumptions are really genuinely shifting. International politics, international relations are shifting. Um, let me put it this way. Um, back in the 1950s, when all the institutions were still new and shaky, uh, I'm sure that people feared that liberal democracy in Western Europe might not last, that NATO, NATO might not work, that communist revolutions might, might happen. Um, I'm sure that in the 1970s, in the era of the Red Brigades in Vietnam, many once again feared that the idea of the West might not survive. Um, but in my adult life, I really can't remember a moment quite as dramatic as this one. Um, right now, I think that we're closer than we've ever been to the end of the Western alliance as we know it, and possibly the liberal democratic world order as we know it. We may be coming to the end of the Western domination of world politics and of the international political system and the economic system. And finally, we are also reaching the end of an era that will be remembered in retrospect for its lack of great power conflict, uh, for its reliance on reason and science, and for its belief that the highest task of government is to ensure the economic well-being of citizens. Now, I can't tell you today with any kind of precision how these changes will affect your businesses, um, but I thought it would be worth carrying out a kind of thought experiment. I'm going to look at four of the big ideas. Um, they don't, they're all a little bit interconnected. They're not exactly all separate. Um, four of the new ways of thinking that are motivating some of these changes, um, and perhaps together we can try and think through some of the consequences. Um, let me start with a word that you probably hear a lot of nowadays. Um, the word is nationalism. It's a large word, can be interpreted to mean a lot of different things. Nationalism is by definition a political philosophy that comes in as many forms as there are countries. You know, here's what it looks like in the United States. You know, here's what it looks like in China. Um, it's not an accident that both of those photographs could also have been taken at football matches. Uh, in its milder forms, nationalism is a kind of tribalism, a feeling that we're all on the same team. Um, it can also shade into patriotism, which is a more idealistic philosophy, a more idealistic way of seeing the world. Um, the belief that it's important to work on behalf of your country and your countrymen to make the community that you live in a better place. Um, but nationalism in the form that it's now returning has really little to do with flags and marches. I mean, these are the kind of, um, you know, that's the, those are the, the, the outward signs of it. Um, it's more to do with the preference for the national state over the interests of foreigners, and even the, and in addition, the preference for the national state over the interests of international institutions, and maybe even the preference of the national state over the interests of particular citizens. Um, in practice, the language of nationalism can serve to protect the interest of a ruling party or a ruling clan or of the nationalist faction. Um, defending that group from the scrutiny of independent media and judiciary. Um, nationalism can also, can in theory, be used as a tool to create, in effect, a one-party state, and we're seeing that in a number of countries around the world. Um, in Europe, Hungary is the country that has gone furthest in that direction, but we also see examples in the Philippines. Um, perhaps that's coming in Brazil. Um, from your point of view, as businessmen who operate all over the world, this is one of the first effects of nationalism to be pondered. Um, namely, it's going to lead to an increase in corruption and cronyism, subjects that I will return to in a minute. Um, from the point of view of this audience, it's also important to remember that the nationalists, um, unlike a, of, of the present, unlike the previous generation of political leaders, are not necessarily wedded to the idea anymore that they must at all costs produce a higher GDP and more prosperity. 
That's not the point of a nationalist government. That's not necessarily what it's most interested in. Um, economic nationalism in its new form has other priorities. Um, just as we saw in the Brexit vote in Britain, there were people who valued the idea of sovereignty higher than the reality of prosperity. Um, there are other examples as well, um, including a few that illustrate the ways in which economic nationalism in particular countries might not even be bad for foreign investors. Um, here's one you haven't heard of probably. Um, a few months ago, the Polish nationalist ruling party bought out a private equity group that had invested in the country's largest ski lift. Um, actually, it's the only significant ski lift. It's not an asset that would seem to most of us terribly important, but by all accounts, the state development pump fund paid double the original price. Um, the purchase represented a huge financial loss for the government and a big gain for the private equity comp company that had bought out the ski lift a few months earlier. Um, nevertheless, the government trumpeted this as a kind of triumphant success. Why? Because the go government had won back an important national asset. In other words, the language of nationalism is not about we're achieving economics victory for all of our people, it's we now own it, it's ours. Um, in recent months, the same Polish government, also using nationalist language, also overpaid Unicredito, the, the Italian bank, for its Polish branch. Once again, the point was that they wanted to win the applause of their electorate. Now they can claim that the majority of banking assets in Poland are now Polish. So this kind of change, this shift in language, we're, we're now gonna see in a number of other countries as well. Um, less good news for foreign investors, of course, would be forced sales of companies owned by foreigners. Um, straightforward nationalization of assets is still very difficult inside the European Union, uh, but of course it's not impossible in other places. We see it returning in other parts of the world. Um, we may even eventually see it in Britain um, if Jeremy Corbyn wins the next election post-Brexit. Um, this would be economic nationalism in its left-wing form. But even if Corbyn doesn't become prime minister, even if nationalist parties do not come to power in Berlin or Paris, where we know they're very strong, or, could, or growing stronger rather, um, the influence of these ideas is strong. Um, one of the things I think that will happen in 2019, just as it was beginning to happen in 2018, is that economic nationalism will even begin to influence centrist parties. In other words, it will become harder, it's already become harder actually, to make arguments in favor of privatization or even public-private partnerships, the kinds of arrangements that we saw being very popular over the last couple of decades, in a climate in which the state and the needs of the state are suddenly so heavily favored. So in any country, if there are political parties arguing loudly that state-owned assets, in principle, are better or more moral than privately-owned assets, whether or not they're better or worse, whether they function better or worse economically, then this is going to affect government policy. Um, it will be very interesting, just as an aside, to watch as in the UK, um, as companies and political institutions begin to anticipate a Corbyn victory, if that's what appears to happen. Um, they will begin to change their language, they will change their attitudes, um, they will change the way that they talk about state and private companies. Um, even if he doesn't win and never wins, um, the strong econo economic nationalism that he supports and stands for will have a lot of influence over public debate. And of course, this is equally the same issue in in a range of countries from Italy to France, um, to Greece, to Spain. Um, finally, economic nationalism may also be accompanied by challenges to the international regulatory order, um, whether it's the WTO and international trade norms or to EU regulation. Um, the EU is a particularly interesting case because the positive effects of European-wide regulatory consistency are now taken for granted in almost every country in Europe, whereas there are occasional negative effects for example, a ruling against a particular country or a particular industry are often widely noted, commented upon, and often used as pieces of propaganda or as, or as political arguments um, by nationalist or proto-nationalist parties. Um, of course, you all know the danger. If a single country decides to obey, disobey the judgments of the European Court of Justice or the EU Commission, then the entire regulatory order is in danger. Um, here I'm thinking of Italian nationalists who may blow up the rules of the Eurozone as much as the Poles who defy rules about the independent judiciary. Um, in the worst case scenario, of course, nationalist objections to EU law or regulation could bring about the end of the European Union. Um, I'm not saying this is gonna happen immediately or this year or next week, um, but as economic nationalism grows, this is certainly a risk to be aware of.
Um, the second idea I'd like to discuss today flows naturally from the first. This is the idea of great power conflict. That might not sound much like an idea or a philosophy, um, but it is. Um, in practice, great power conflict, meaning large-scale military or hostile political competition between major powers, is something that none of us has really experienced in our lifetimes. Of course, many of us are, even I am old enough to remember the Cold War, um, but the Cold War was really a form of sublimated great power conflict. It was a time at which the US and the USSR, working through proxies, through small wars in other countries, through the nuclear arms race and other kinds of competition, um, you know, established a rivalry with one another, but there was never a direct conflict. Since the 1990s, we've lived in a world where we assumed almost subconsciously that even that kind of proxy war no longer threatened us. War and conflict, we assumed, would be asymmetric at best. It would come from terrorists or jihadis. Um, and we've, we've spent quite a lot of the last two decades thinking about how small groups of people can use weapons or terrorist actions or dirty bombs or other kinds of activity to disrupt um, bigger powers. But big confrontations between the U.S. and Russia, between the U.S. and China, or between Russia and China, seem to all of us unlikely or impossible. Well, welcome to 2019, where these kinds of conflicts now really have to be anticipated once again by anybody who's seriously looking at the world, whether as a business person or as a, as a citizen. Um, in part, this is because the nationalism, the, the, the new mood that I've just been describing, has a military and foreign policy element as well as an economic side. Um, it's not an accident that Russia and China have spent so much money in recent years building up their military forces, or that President Trump, who actually seems to dislike the idea of US troops abroad, nevertheless wants more money to go to the Pentagon. Um, he spoke a few months ago about wanting a big military parade in Washington. Um, he likes the idea, the appearance of, of, of a strong military um, in his country. Sooner or later, nationalists may also need to prove their bona fides through clashes with other countries. That's ultimately how they back up their philosophy of national superiority. But in addition to the ordinary militarism that exists in all of these countries, and all, really in all societies, I would argue that we have a couple of new elements at work as well. Um, you know, one is that great power conflict is now fully integrated into domestic politics. So in Russia, in China, and I'm afraid also in the United States, conflicts with foreign powers are now being openly seen in a very, um, not even terribly subtle way, as a means of protecting and enhancing the personal power of political leaders. So it's not an accident that just as Russia abandons really any pretense of democracy, as China, which was ruled by party meritocracy for a couple of decades, changes over to one-man rule, or, or as we have the most anti-institutional American president in probably in American history, um, that we're seeing how this happens. Um, the nuances are different in different countries. You know, since the US election, I think we've all become aware of the fact that Russia now has a strategy that seeks openly to undermine Western de democracy. Um, we also become, we're becoming a bit clear about what that strategy is. Now that we know that the Kremlin doesn't invent anti-European or anti-democratic politicians or, or political parties, um, but it does support them now in whatever form they exist, customizing tactics to suit each country um, aggressively and consistently. You know, thus Russian media and money and business help support far-right parties in Hungary, Italy, Austria, um, while at the same time they keep up their connections to Die Linke, the former East German Communist Party. Um, in Greece and the UK, curiously, both the far-right and the far-left have Russian links. Um, the question is why? Why are they doing this? And the answer is that the Russian political elite, and in particular uh, the Russian president, are afraid not so much of a Western military threat, but of the Western democracy narrative. So why was Putin so upset about uh, street demonstrations in Moscow in 2011, which he said, and may well have believed, were funded by the United States, and he even said Hillary Clinton? Why was he so shocked about, by the, U the Ukrainian Maidan revolution in 2014? That was the moment, if you remember, when young Ukrainians waved EU flags, um, chanted slogans against corruption, and ev eventually, entered and photographed the vulgar palace which the former president had lived in. Uh, the, the reason why is, is this is exactly what Putin fears most. 
Uh, he sees these kinds of movements and these kinds of events coming as he sees it, inspired by Western democracy as threatening him personally and his power. And so his desire to undermine the West is really visceral. Um, he's doing it because only when the EU is dismantled and NATO is neutralized and democracy is shown to be farcical, only then will he feel personally safe. Um, for that reason, I think it's important to contemplate at least the question whether this kind of aggression could at some point cease to be a troll war and an influence buying war of the kind we're now familiar with, and at what point it becomes a hot war or, or what looks begins to become like a hot war. Um, here in Scandinavia, you will, of course, be aware that Putin is building up his forces in the Baltic region and using the occasional aircraft or submarine to test NATO readiness or in Swedish or Finnish self-defense, um, not to mention occasionally testing the guards on the Estonian border. Um, the purpose of these exercises is, of course, psychological. The idea is to intimidate Western countries, to create fear and anxiety, to create distrust, um, again, to create a public feeling that our government isn't doing enough, isn't protecting us. Um, but it's also not impossible to imagine a future moment when Putin, or a successor perhaps, afraid of losing power, seeks to extend one of these exercises further. You know, he is now a politician who cannot resign or retire. He has killed too many people, he's stolen too much money, uh, too many people know where the bodies are buried, figuratively and literally. Um, if he becomes desperate to stay in power, he's not beyond you know, another attempt to create a victory abroad, to create more support at home, um, as he did in Ukraine. And now I'm sure all of this sounds ridiculous, even hysterical, maybe off topic, to people like yourselves who think that economics and prosperity should be the main concern of governments. Um, but this kind of posturing is actually also what lies behind the current trade clash between the US and China. Now, there is, of course, a case to be made that the, the US trade war with China has some legitimate origins. Um, it is true that China steals intellectual property. Um, we know that China has discriminated against foreign businesses. Um, there's, a, there's a judicious reason, there's a judicious use why you could use trade sanctions to curb some of these trends, to make the Western relationship with China more fair from our point of view. All that is you know, legitimate. There's a legitimate discussion about whether um, whether our relations with China have been created on a fair basis. But a judicious use of trade sanctions is not what the Trump administra administration has tried to deploy in China. You know, Trump doesn't think in terms of alliances. He didn't, for example, consider first talking to the European Union about how to change Chinese behavior. He didn't initiate a discussion about what the best tactics or techniques would be. What he sought instead was a clash, um, and it was a clash designed to inflate his own image to appeal to his own supporters, uh, and to create political momentum for himself. So this is a different kind of American leadership that we haven't seen before, whereas the purpose of US foreign policy um, is really solely in order to promote the image and the political stance of the US president. Um, the Trump has also made another change in the way it deals with foreign powers, um, though it's not one that everybody has noticed. Um, historically, there was a doctrine in the US that kept economic negotiations separate from military and political negotiations. This has now been dropped. So you might have noticed, for example, that Trump wants to use threats against NATO and even hints of cutting US funding for NATO. He's done that a little bit behind the scenes as well as in public in order to goad European on trade, Europeans on trade. So the idea that these were separate issues, that NATO was somehow sacrosanct, and that we can now, but that now we're going to blur things. We're going to use security issues to influence trade and vice versa. This is something the Trump administration began, has really been interested in from the beginning. But now that the US has made that shift, what's to stop, say, the Chinese from doing the same? You know, if China really begins to suffer from a trade war, and if Xi Jinping's, for example, personal status and legitimacy begin to suffer too, why shouldn't China also open another realm of conflict? In Taiwan, for example. Uh, or the South China Sea. You know, it's not just Putin who can use short wars of victorious conquest against, you know, weak partners to bolster his status. Um, nor is it just Putin who can use trolls and bots and cyber warfare to destabilize his political enemies. Uh, up until now, the Chinese have used those kinds of tactics very sparingly. Um, cyber warfare particularly directed at business and for business purposes but there's really no reason why at some later stage um, they shouldn't begin to contemplate a wider use of it.
Now, the implications of rising global great power conflict, of the increased possibility for tension, are difficult to predict, maybe impossible. I mean, the long-term impact of trade destabilization, you can all imagine. If you have more trade wars, this will shrink the outreach of companies. If we're to move from global to regional supply chains, then economies of scale, scale get lost, profits will go down. Um, this could harm global companies and help local ones. Um, on the other hand, local ones are often suppliers to global ones, so I would really hesitate to make any kind of grand statement or prediction for investors based on these possibilities. You would have to look company by company and, and country by country. Other consequences of increased global conflict and the, the, the return of the idea that great power conflict is a possibility um, are even more difficult to guess. For example, in a world in which these kinds of conflicts undermine or destroy the WTO, for example, the WTO being the organization like the EU, and an organization like the EU and the NATO that Trump says he hates. Um, the alternative may not be a world in which the US dictates the rules. The alternative may be that China, for example, imposes its technical and banking standards on the countries which take its loans and projects. Um, we may therefore begin, even before we get to great power conflict, the influence of it and the awareness of it, again, may be, begin to increase divisions, just as the anticipation of nationalism or the, the fact that it's in the air changes the behavior of political parties, the anticipation of great power conflicts may do the same. In other words, we may begin to see divisions between those parts of the world that follow so-called Western rules and those who follow China or Russia. Uh, as people begin to become afraid of conflict, you see divisions creating, uh, div divisions following. Um, as for future military conflict, I'm not gonna speculate now what, what could happen in this forum. Um, I'll just say that once we cross into that realm, all of the predictions that any of us have made today um, are off. Third big idea I'd like to talk today about is disinformation. You know, I'm sure you've all, in every country now, there's been a big discussion of so-called fake news, fake stories, the ease with which they get passed around. But I think what's really at stake is something a lot deeper. You know, look around the democratic world. Almost everywhere, large newspapers and powerful broadcasters are disappearing. With the exception of a very few very powerful newspapers, the financial assumptions that have supported them for the last couple of centuries simply no longer hold. Both advertisers and readers have moved to the internet. No model of payment has replaced all of those paying hard copy subscriptions, and it's not going to. Um, and as they grow weaker, other things die as well. So these old-fashioned news organizations might have had as their founding principle at least a commitment in theory to objectivity, to fact-checking, to the general public interest. They served as a filter, eliminating egregious conspiracy theories. More importantly, whatever you think about their objectivity or lack of it, they also created, in all of our countries, the possibility of a national conversation or a single debate. In some big European countries where they're well-funded public broadcasters obligated by law to be politically neutral, you know, this, this function still exists. The media still serves that purpose. But in many smaller European countries, the independent media has become very weak or has ceased to exist entirely, having been replaced by media which is either controlled by the government and operated by the ruling party or else controlled by ruling parties via large business groups connected to them. So in the United States, there is now really no broadcaster and no newspaper which both sides of the political spectrum consider to be neutral. Now, there, there's nowhere where everybody would appear at the same time and have a debate and feel that the rules were fair. Um, the result of this we know, and the result is polarization. People choose sides, they move apart, the center disappears. And polarization has other side effects. Um, in many democracies now, there's now no longer a common debate, let alone a common narrative. Um, and this is not just about different opinions or different biases. People actually don't have the same facts. Um, one group thinks one set of things is true, another believes in something different. Um, we often find ourselves arguing not about the way to move forward, but about what happened yesterday. And this, I should say, is not just true in countries where, it's, where, it's, where, you, where you're, you recognize it already, for example, the United States, or in Poland, where I spent a lot of time, where there's a clear bifurcation of the media. It's also true in a, in a different way in Germany. Um, I was part of a study that looked at the last German elections and found that there was, you know, you, you could do a map of what Germans read, and about 80% of the country fit into one cluster. 
and there were all kinds of cross hatches and people reading, looking at German state media or reading Die Welt or, or reading Süddeutsche Zeitung. And then there was another side, much smaller but still significant, gr side group of people who read completely different media. And these were, of course, the AFD voters who live now in a separate bubble inside Germany with surprisingly little contact with mainstream media. So it's not just about the big divisions we see in the US. Um, social media accelerates and accentuates this phenomenon because it allows people, and indeed with its algorithm, sometimes forces people to see only the news and opinion that they want to hear, whether factual or not. Um, the algorithms that reinforce comforting narratives have created homogenous clusters online, otherwise known as echo chambers. You know how this works. People now get their news from their close-knit, ideologically familiar friends. Um, most members of an echo chamber share the same prevailing worldview and interpret news through this common lens. But this deeper polarization has other effects. Um, from your point of view, you should be worried about di growing distrust for what used to be considered apolitical and neutral institutions. Civil service, police, judiciary, and government-run bodies all, of all kinds, actually, fall under suspicion in polarized societies because one side or the other, or sometimes both, suspects that they have been captured by the opposite party. Um, same thing also has a traditional lethal effect on traditional political parties, which were once based on real life institutions like trade unions or the church. Um, nowadays, more and more people identify with groups or organizations or just ideas and themes that they find in the virtual world. You know, people can reach across traditional social and geographic lines to form interest groups in ways that undermine traditional politics, either for better or for worse. Um, some new parties succeed in converting virtual support into real votes. Um, one thinks of Macron's En Marche, or the very different Italian five-star movement. But in many places, this phenomenon had simply led to fragmentation. Um, you all are aware of the political crisis in Sweden, which is a very good example, or else just to incoherence. Um, the flip side of En Marche, you know, a new political party, is the Gilets Jaunes movement, which is an apolitical pol protest movement that seeks to use violence to disrupt democracy altogether. Again, it's a movement that came together originally online, it doesn't have a part and a place in the political system. It seeks instead to use apolitical or kind of anti-political means to make its point. Um, this new information network with its deep divides and its suspicious clans is also far more conducive than the old one to the spread of false rumors. And this is now the fake news subject, whether generated naturally imposed from outside as well as to campaigns of insider and outsider manipulation. So to put it bluntly, and this has now been shown in several surveys and studies, people who live in highly partisan echo chambers are much more likely to believe false information if they receive it from partisan sources they trust. So the more partisan and the more polarized, the more susceptible to conspiracy theories, disinformation campaigns, and false information. And this, of course, is a weakness that can be exploited, um, as we've now seen several times. So we've seen this effect of malign influence campaigns on elections. Um, but elections aren't, needn't be the only target. Um, a couple of years ago, the US Defense Department uncovered a Russian effort to hijack more than 10,000 Twitter users at the Pentagon. Messages were sent linking, linking to stories about sporting events or celebrities, but when clicked, the links took users to a Russian-controlled server. Uh, automatically, the server downloaded a program allowing Moscow's hackers to take control of the victim's phone or computer as well as Twitter account. Um, that scheme was rumbled, but think about what might have happened if it had succeeded. Imagine the chaos that could be unleashed if authentic Defense Department social media accounts with the authority of US armed forces behind them began tweeting disinformation. What if this happened during a natural disaster? You know, what if it happened during a terrorist attack? What if the terrorist attack was begun deliberately in the disinformation campaign planned in advance? Um, all of you can imagine the consequences, um, but I'll finish, th I'll finish this topic by reminding you that it's not just Russian disinformation that can take advantage of these polarized networks and the polarization in society. Really, any political party can do it, any hostile country can do it, um, any private company can do it. Um, the techniques are not difficult, the use of bots and trolls and the creation of influence groups, we all know how that works now. Um, I can also imagine how it could be used to disrupt commercial transactions. We've already seen trolling campaigns against companies. One can imagine those being connected to real life events too. And in 2019, we'll see more of this and not less. 
Finally, a few minutes ago, I promised I would speak a bit about corruption, so let me fulfill that promise and focus on the fourth and final idea that I think will dominate 2019 and beyond, and this is the drive for financial transparency. Um, in an odd way, this is a subject that I think links some of the others together. You know, we tend to imagine that international money laundering and corruption are one of the kind of a side issue, something of interest to small numbers of people. But we now live in a world in which approximately 10% of the world's wealth is thought to be held offshore. Laundered money, we know, is one of the elements propping up the city of London. Um, indeed, one of the reasons why several large British hedge funds supported the Brexit campaign was because they feared European Union rules on financial markets in general and money laundering in particular, which would have hampered their, hampered their ability to do business. Um, a few statistics to remind you over the past day, decade, 68 billion pounds has flowed from Russia alone into Britain's offshore satellites. Um, in addition to that, you know, some 94 billion has poured out of Russia into Cyprus, 13 billion into Switzerland, 23 billion even into the Netherlands. Um, by one estimate, more than half of Russians' total wealth is held offshore in this manner, some $800 billion, um, and by a tiny number of people, perhaps a few hundred. Uh, what it, what is, how is this money being used and how is it being perceived? Well, one, it's being used, as I described at the very beginning, um, by Russians and by others to support political figures, to buy political process, um, to invest in, uh, to, to create influence campaigns uh, among particular company, uh, countries in order to achieve pro-Russian outcomes or even simply to achieve advantage for Russian companies and business. Um, hidden offshore money is, of course, one of the sources of Putin's power, one of the ways in which he came to power. Um, he, there was a, those of you who know this story will be familiar that the, he and a large group of former KGB officers stole money out of the country. They took it abroad, they laundered it through the West, and then they brought it back in the country and used that to buy property um, and eventually, eventually to create new business networks that allowed them to come to power. So a very, in a very real sense, this is the basis of their power. Um, the Chinese political class now uses offshore money in a different way. Um, it's a kind of hedging uh, mechanism. Um, they, money is kept abroad in anticipation of possible unpleasant changes or possible anti-corruption um, campaigns by the government. So m money is kept out of the country um, as, a, as a sort of hedging mechanism in case things go badly. Um, in a certain sense, Trump himself is a product of international money laundering and of the lack of transparency in, in international financial transactions. You know, when you think about how he made his money, how he, how he became the success that he became, quite a lot of it came out of New York real estate at a moment when quite a lot of money was coming into New York real estate and Miami real estate, um, not just from Russia, but from the whole post-Soviet world. One of his sons is famously on the record saying, a huge amount of our investment comes from Russia. This is in the late 1990s. Um, and, there's a, and if you look at the number of his properties, the number of his companies that have anonymous, um, which have been bought by anonymous or by companies that are owned by, um, through, through anonymous shell companies, you can see the flow of money into his business that kept him afloat and kept him alive at certain points after he went bankrupt. Much of this may come also from the offshore world. Um, Hidden money is also one of the sources of inequality that's inspiring populist movements. Um, again, like the, I've mentioned the Gilets Jaunes already. Um, Brexit, paradoxically, although it was supported by hedge funds, it's also, um, it's also a, a source of anger in Britain that you know, money seems to be coming from abroad. No one knows where it's from. You know, why is there this huge degree of inequality in our country? Um, or indeed, um, Salvini in, in, in Italy. Um, What's the point of me talking about this now is that I believe a backlash is coming. Um, if we're lucky, it's going to be a centrist backlash led by mainstream politicians. For example, if we're lucky, and I say this as, a, as a, somebody who's always been a conservative, um, if we're lucky, it will be led by someone like Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's written a bill focusing on political corruption and proposing laws restricting lobbying and the misuse of money in US politics. Um, I would expect at some point in the future a serious anti-corruption, anti-fraud coalition to emerge internationally because the same issues now afflict not just the United States and Britain, but the entire Western alliance. Um, as I've said, all of our political systems are now vulnerable to Russian and Chinese bribery and influence buying. 
Um, you know, and all of our online media is now the target of uh, political manipulation campaigns paid for by these same sources of funding. Um, to preserve our democracies and maintain rule of law, we need to push back as allies using not just sanctions, but also new laws limiting or eliminating the use of tax havens and the broader money laundering toolkit. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that so much of the newly energetic far right depends on Russian money or Russian propaganda or that so many of its members are steeped in corruption. Um, they've successfully turned the intention, attention of law enforcement in multiple countries away from themselves or their cronies and instead focused anger on a refugee crisis that's been blown well out of proportion. Um, if we are unlucky, the target of anger about these, these, these practices will be not just the money launderers, and those who break the law, um, but the entire financial system. I mean, look, in a way, we've all been lucky up until now. The, um, uh, the, you know, the backlash against banks that might have come after 2008 and 2009 and against investors has been relatively mild and relatively weak. Um, you know, it, 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 it might have taken on a much larger form um, and the potential, whether in the form of Corbyn, in the form of far left movements in, in all across Europe, um, the potential for something worse is, is certainly there. Um, but let me leave you with a final picture. Um, uh, you know, a final, rather than a photograph, a final thought, because I don't want to, I don't want to picture this, I want you to imagine it. Um, what if the animus of these, you know, that's uh, against this sense of, you know, inequality and international money and things that we no longer control, what if it turns against you and your company? Um, are you prepared for that kind of backlash? Um, have you thought about it both as a business person, really, and as a citizen? Um, and what are you doing to prevent that from happening? All right, let me end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne Applebaum. That was, that was really interesting, although um, somewhat disturbing, I might <laughs> Uh, must admit. Um, I have a few, uh, we have a few questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. Can I start by asking uh, something that you didn't touch upon in your uh, um, uh, lecture? Um, Prime Minister Theresa May has announced that there will be uh, an election. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> Not, nope. No election, a parliamentary vote on right. the Brexit deal. Yes. Yes. Um, given the uh, parliamentary situation, um, what do you think the outcome will be, and um, what impact could that have on uh, Europe? So, thank you for asking me to predict the future, which is completely <laughs> impossible. Um, I think those of you who followed the Brexit situation know that the, the, the crisis really is a parliamentary crisis. There is no agreement, there is no... It's not just that there's no majority for Theresa May's plan, there's no majority for anything. There's no majority to leave, there's no majority to stay, um, there's no majority for a no deal, there's no majority for her deal, there's no majority for anything. Um, and the, so the, the, par the paralysis that you see is a reflection of that. Um, for that reason, I'd really hesitate to make a prediction about what will happen because right now, if I look at what we know about how the parliament is going to vote, the answer is that they'll vote against her deal. Um, and then we'll be in the situation of a no deal Brexit with all the unknowability and, and potential for crisis that that entails. Um, however, faced with, the with that possibility, you may also have in the next couple of weeks, I mean, we, the vote is, is very soon, you may well have people shifting and changing sides. You know, people saying, well, I'll do anything to prevent that. And so I'll do anything and therefore I'll switch sides. So a certain number of people who are now Remainers may switch. Um, a certain number of people who are against her deal may suddenly find they're in favor of it if they see that the alternative is is no deal. So we're, we're um, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what will happen, basically. <laughs> okay. I don't want to be a hostage um, fortune. I'm, I'm going to ask you a stupid question, but it does, uh, it does there have... There are no stupid uh, questions. Oh, there is. This one is. Nope. Um, okay. <laughs> are we getting more stupid? I mean, given, given <laughs> what you've talked... That is a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> given uh, what you said about uh, polarization, the echo chambers, the, uh, the whole thing... No, I don't think we're more stupid, but um, I think that we haven't fully taken on board the significance of the media revolution and what it means for 
how we get and process political information. Because so much of our democratic societies really did depend on an agreement about what the main issues were, an agreement about how we measure things, you know, an agreement about who we are, you know, that, that, that we, we all agreed that, okay, some people are left-wing and some people are right-wing, but we all think that unemployment is a problem, okay? We're now living in a world in which some people don't know that unemployment is a problem because they don't see those statistics, they see different statistics, and they, in any way they live in an echo chamber where the real problem isn't unemployment, the real problem is Muslim refugees. You know, or the real problem is, um, you know, banks stealing your money. So, so the, the difficulty, the, 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 the depth of this revolution, the fact that what we've lost is not just, um, it's not just that we've become stupid, it's that we don't agree anymore on how we measure things and what the facts are and what the main topics are. And this is why I think the disinformation is, the main topic is, the, 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 the reason why it's important is because it feeds this sense of polarization and, the, and it undermines existing institutions. I mean, again, it's not a coincidence that in so many, when you've seen these kinds of popular, these very polarizing populist governments come to power, one of the first assaults they make is on the civil service. In other words, on people who are meant to be neutral servants of the state, not members of a party. You see that in the Trump administration, you see it in Poland, um, you, you, know, you, you, you see it everywhere. And the reason is that the, 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 the way these, these new kinds of parties work is they define anybody outside their group as necessarily against them. In other words, there can be no neutral servants of the state. There is no middle ground. Um, there is no civil service. There aren't people, there aren't scientists making neutral measurements. Everything is politicized. Um, and once you have that, you, have, you, you, know, you simply have this inability to find a center ground to talk anymore. Mm -hmm. But in, in connection with that, what about democracy? Can democracy be saved? Well, that's, you know, that's, that's a, not a difficult question at all. Um, look, I think democracy can be saved, but it may well be that the participation of ordinary citizens, um, you know, people like yourselves, uh, is going to have to be different from what it once was. You know, in a way, democracy for a long time has functioned the way that running water does. You know, it's just a thing that comes out of the sink. You don't think about where it comes from. You don't have to do anything in order to get it. It's just, it just arrives every morning and it's just something you live with. You know, if you live in an African country where there's no running water, then water is a really important thing you have to think about all the time. I have to, you have to walk to a well to get it. You have to arrange your day around organizing it. Maybe you have to um, you know, use desalination equipment. Maybe you have special arrangements you have to make in order to get that water. And the water becomes a part of your life in a way that it's not for us. Um, if you've ever lived in an undemocratic country or a faulty country which differ with, with poor democracy, then you'll know that for many people, I mean, I think, for example, of my friends in Ukraine, democracy is like that water in an African country. It's something you have to think about all the time. Maybe you have to participate in NGOs. Maybe you have to um, donate money to you know, your, your local newspaper to keep it afloat. Maybe you have to be part of politics or part of political parties in a way that you know, really, if you were living in a nice country like Norway, you wouldn't really have to because it wouldn't matter so much. Um, and I think that the, the, the means of saving democracy is going to come when enough people realize that this is necessary, that it's not just something like the running water or the tap that you can assume is always there, but it begins to be something that all of us have to take part in and think about and contribute to with our, either our time or our money in ways that we haven't up until now. I mean, certainly, for example, that's something that's happening in the United States. I mean, I know lots of people who are now involved in politics, not even necessarily party politics, but in, uh, in, in, in political organizations and NGOs in a way they simply wouldn't have been 10 years ago because you didn't need to be, and now people are. Great. Is there any reasonable hope for a pro-Western regime in Russia, or are there uh, alternatives to Putin um, even worse? Well, everything can always get worse. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, Putin does speak for the Russian elite as it is now. And uh, having, having said that, it's a very small group of people. So I think he, um, you know, I think many of the alternatives to him are people who would be not so different from him. Um, however, one of the oddities about Russia now, and this is something that's been true of Russian history, I think, forever, is that it's not just that we don't know who Putin's successor is, 
we don't know what the mechanism of succession will be. So we don't know how power will next change hands in Russia. Um, there's, no, there's no method, there's no system, there's no institution. Um, it's, it's, as if, it's, it's as if Stalin died. Those of you who have seen the movie Death of Stalin will know this moment of panic and hysteria. Who's the next leader? We don't know and we don't know how to choose him and it will just be a power struggle. Um, and so I think we're at that stage again and therefore I don't think you can exclude the idea that from somewhere in the peace of the Russian elite that is interested in having a good relationship with the West at the very least, and is interested in main, you know, being able to travel abroad. Um, you can't exclude the idea that somebody from that milieu could lead the country. Um, there is no reason why Russia is condemned to be anti-Western or condemned to be anti-democratic. Um, and as I, as I said in my, in my remarks, I, I think that the, the assault on democracy that has come from Russia over the last um, decade or so um, is very person that is very personal to Putin. That's because he personally sees democratic rhetoric and the language of the West as threatening to him personally. So this is, it's about me, you know, it's about, it's about me, Putin, defending myself against this kind of language. And I can very well imagine a leader of Russia who didn't see that kind of threat, who saw that, um, that there were, you know, that there, once again, that there is a, it's not a zero sum game you know, that there are ways in which Russia can share power with the West. So it's not, it's not impossible, but the difficulty again in predicting is that we don't know, the, we don't know how, who, who will be chosen or how he will be chosen. Thank you very much, Anne Applebaum. Thank you. Thank you. Og det var rett og slett siste ord i denne sammenheng. Jeg har lyst til å minne dere om at dere kommer til å få en e-post med en liten oppsummering og med litt lenker og, og ting fra oss, så at dere ikke glemmer denne fine dagen. For å holde oss i eventyrmetaforen som jeg begynte med i dag, snipp, snapp, snute, denne dagen er over. Tusen takk for at dere kom, og vel hjem!